Woohoo! All right. Um, let's see. Week, no, day. Day seven. Uh, good, kind, online, faceless folks of Sociology 240. Today is day seven. We are officially halfway there. Uh, so that's exciting, right? It does go fast. Okay, so today we're talking about urban sprawl. That's the topic for the day. So you read this piece called Sprawl Costs, and that's what we're going to be focusing on in this presentation. So sprawl, what is it? You've heard the word, what does it mean? Well, it's got, there are a bunch of different ways that we could define sprawl. We could think about it as the urbanization of the rural, right? So you've got rural areas that are disconnected from urban areas that are uh, geographically remote from urban areas. And sprawl is the stuff that kind of begins to connect them, that turns rural areas more urban um, or that radiates out from urban areas towards rural areas. Sprawl is the unlimited outward development of real estate into undeveloped areas. Okay, so in other words, urban areas sprawl outwards, right? They sprawl towards the rural, and so you take areas that have not been developed and develop them, and this becomes sprawl. Sprawl can also be defined, oh, that's weird animation, as cookie cutter development, right? So when we think of sprawl, I guess an easy way to think of sprawl would be to think of the suburbs. And um, so the suburbs, you know, the suburbs kind of all look the same, right? I mean, if you're over here on Veterans Parkway, you know, you're going to see like your Red Lobster and your TGI Fridays and your Chili's and your Applebee's and your walmart and your home depot and all these things and you go any other place and everything's going to look exactly the same in the sprawl right downtowns are going to look very different they're going to have distinct stores with distinct character but the sprawl is going to look the same anywhere you go so it's cookie cutter development and the reason why real estate developers that produce sprawl like cookie cutter development is because it's cost effective, right? You've got one plan, you uh, buy all your materials from the same person, you know, um, you, you know what they sell, they know what you buy, you've got one plan, uh, never has to deviate, and you can build it with uh, cheap materials in large quantities anywhere in the world. And so cookie cutter development is easy to do, it's cost effective to do, uh, the disadvantage for some is that it looks the same as everywhere else in the world. To some, that doesn't matter. And sprawl can be thought of as well as high density, I'm sorry, high intensity and low density real estate development. So what exactly are we talking about here? Well, the density refers to population density. So low density means you've got fewer people per square area, whatever that may be, square foot, square mile, square meter. You've got fewer people per surface area than you would in urban settings. But the intensity is higher, and intensity in this case refers to uh, energy use, uh, trash production, these sorts of things. So sprawl is bad for the environment. And that isn't always perfectly intuitive. Because when you see a city, you see this giant behemoth of, uh, you know, burning fossil fuels and all these crazy lights on all the time. I mean, look at Las Vegas, for example, or even downtown Chicago. You don't see that and think to yourselves, oh, how, how cost effective, how, um, how environmentally friendly, right? And sprawl is less grandiose than downtown parts of cities. And yet here we are saying that it's less environmentally friendly. So that's not an immediately intuitive observation, but it makes a bit more sense when we start to think about efficiency. And we will be talking about that in just a minute. So high intensity, 
Intensity here refers to energy consumption, waste production, environmental degradation, and lower density, fewer people per square area. And sprawl is also characterized by the premature or poorly planned conversion of rural land to other uses. In other words, sprawl is usually not thought out very carefully. Sprawl is usually thrown up very quickly without a lot of forethought. And then finally, it's land use that's not functionally, functionally related to adjacent land uses. In other words, this goes back to the sort of Euclidean zoning idea. Everything is separated out by land use type. So these are the different ways, these are the different ways that we can define and characterize sprawl. Sprawl is also um, a manifestation of Euclidean zoning, which we've talked about previously, so I won't belabor that again. And this is kind of what sprawl looks like, right? This is what you think about when you think about the suburbs. You think about all these houses along cul-de-sacs, um, feeder roads, and every house looks exactly the same. They're large. They've got large uh, yards. For some reason, they don't ever have any trees in them. I frankly can't understand how people can live in, in places with no trees. It seems crazy, but that's people like it, I guess. So this is what sprawl sort of looks like, at least re, um, residential sprawl. Commercial sprawl might look something like this, right? A big box store with an ocean of uh, parking, you know, just this sort of like asphalt ocean out there. And the parking lot is, you know, never quite full. Um, so that's, that's, you know, commercial sprawl. And of course we have sprawl right here in town. We're very familiar with sprawl, so if you've ever been to the shops at College Hills or actually anywhere out on Veterans, or if you've ever seen any of the real estate development, the residential real estate development east of Veterans, uh, those subdivisions, that's what sprawl looks like. There are essentially three types of sprawl. And these three types, as you can see here, um, have sort of all have kinds of relationships to, to roads, to highways, to avenues of mobility. Um, so this kind of doubles back into this theme of machines, money, and mobility that we talked about a few days ago. Uh, so the first type of urban sprawl is what's referred to here as extending the urban boundary. And um, so this would be, uh, for example, like uh, the, sh the suburbs of Chicago, a place that many of us are probably familiar with, right? So uh, urban areas need to grow. Um, people want to be in urban areas, uh, but people want less expensive living um, near urban areas. And so as a result, they tend to grow outwards toward rural areas, and this creates suburbs of large cities and they sort of radiate out in concentric circles obviously in um, in Chicago they're not concentric circles because you can't really build subdivisions on Lake Michigan but they radiate out towards the west um, the second type of sprawl is leapfrog sprawl this is sprawl that's disconnected where where pieces of development are disconnected from one another in other words not adjacent to one another and this can be in part as the as the sort of diagram here demonstrates because of um, a highway or a road that kind of gets in the way and bisects developments but often this has to do with it's motivated by the uh, quest for cheaper land and so when one of us develops a piece of land the land around that development um, is, uh, becomes higher priced, right? The price is raised of the land, not the developed land itself, although that land is certainly worth more, but the value is more in the land that is undeveloped but adjacent to the developed land. And so if you want to build in the area, but you want to build for 
uh, you, you want to buy your land as, as inexpensively as possible, you need to skip over the land that's adjacent to the existing development and move farther away. And so that's how leapfrog sprawl is created, where there are developments around one another, but they're not adjacent to one another, so they, in effect, consume more land. And then the third type of sprawl is what's called here ribbon sprawl. Ribbon sprawl is the stuff that crops up around highways where there are intersections of highways. You know, highways uh, bring a lot of people around. And um, so wherever there are intersections, like Bloomington Normal, for example, is at the intersection of 39, 74, and 55. And so three interstates come together here and we get a lot of uh, sort of economic benefit from that. People get off the road, they stay in hotels, they get gas, they eat and so on and so forth. So wherever you have the intersections of highways, you have ribbon sprawl arising. All right, so what are the problems with sprawl, right? I mean, most of us live in the suburbs, we like the suburbs. Um, uh, the, the majority of Americans want to be in the suburbs. And so there must be something good about it. And yet we're reading this stuff called sprawl costs we're talking about what's wrong with it. So what are the problems with sprawl? Well, to start off, it is particularly energy inefficient, right? So sprawl is set up, remember the social organization of convenience, the way we have designed our world to accommodate cars, and then we say to ourselves, well, I can't live without a car. Well, it's because you designed your damn world so that you couldn't live without a car. Um, so the sprawl is the sort of embodiment of this social organization of convenience. We've set it up so that we cannot walk. We've set it up so that we can't bike. Um, there, is, there are not enough people to warrant uh, public transportation like buses, uh, but there are too many people for everybody to just be pedestrians. And so you have to drive everywhere you go. You can't walk anywhere you go. And that makes it energy efficient, although that's by no means the only reason why it's energy inefficient. Sprawl is more costly for the government um, and therefore for the taxpayers. And some of the reasons why sprawl is more costly, if you think about it, so people are more spread out in the sprawl. And this is why it is... Um, less energy efficient than the city, even though the city consumes a net amount of energy that's much greater than the sprawl. Sprawl is energy inefficient because there are fewer people on a larger amount of land. So, for example, if you lived in the city and you lived in an apartment, and your apartment building was, you know, one face of one block long, how many people do you think would be in that essentially what is... Um, half of a block, right? I mean, you would have, you know, hundreds of families, so several hundred people maybe in one building. And, and each of them would have less space. But if you're in the sprawl, to have several hundred people, um, you would have to have a whole subdivision, right? With many, 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 many houses, because in the, in the area, in the surface area, that in the city we can accommodate 500 people, in the sprawl we've got one giant McMansion with a three-car garage that's only got five people in it. And so we're taking up the same amount of space for five people in the sprawl that we are for 500 people in the city. And so when you live in the city, because you've got a smaller area, it's more densely packed, you're consuming less energy to heat your area, you're consuming uh, less energy to light it up and these sorts of things. And so the city is more energy efficient in that regard. So com coming back to this bullet point here, why is it more expensive for the city government? Well, think about this. The city government has to provide all these services to uh, domiciles, right? To residences. It's got to provide trash collection. It's got to provide sewers. It's got to provide roads, it has to provide f police service, it has to provide um, firefighting service, and so on and so forth, right? 
Well, if you can get, I mean, if you could pick up 500 families trash with one truck in the city, right? Everything goes into a dumpster. Think about the dorms on campus. Everything goes into a dumpster. One truck, one time, comes and takes 500 people's trash. In the sprawl, that truck, you know, that one stop, instead of 500 people's trash, it's only collecting four people's trash. And then it's got to go to the next house and the next house. And so the amount of distance that the truck has to cover to collect 500 people's trash in the sprawl is considerably greater. So we're talking about greater fuel costs. We're talking about greater wear and tear on the car. We're talking about greater salary for the driver and so on and so forth. And so to service the same number of people in the sprawl as in the city, it's considerably more expensive. The same rule applies for sewers, right? You've got to build these sewers out. I mean, if we're serving 500 people in one fell swoop with the, ser with the sewers, we only have to build it out to that one building and we're done. To serve 500 people with sewers, we got to, in the sprawl, we've got to build 500 stops. Um, the same goes for, you know, the same principle applies to police uh, patrolling the area or firefighters that need to get out to the area or the cost of building roads out to an area and so on and so forth. And so it's considerably more expensive for local governments to service sprawl than it is to service a downtown area. And that extends, of course, then to taxpayers as well. The sprawl is a problem because it favors large corporations over small stores. And, of course, because it consumes fragile land and reduces surface area for farming and wildlife. And also, and this is curious, sprawl, sprawl creates segregation. And, of course, there's plenty of segregation in our cities. But why would sprawl create segregation? That's an interesting thing. And, and it mostly comes down to the idea of Euclidean zoning. We've talked about this before. When you zone by land use type, you also zone, you also produce separate zones. You create separate zones for lower income families, middle income families, and wealthy families. And you separate them out in this way so that they aren't in uh, a whole lot of contact with one another, and that produces segregation, produces uh, sort of socioeconomic segregation, which also um, means racial segregation. And sprawl can have, at least many folks argue, that sprawl has a negative effect on social capital as well. However, as we said, the majority of Americans live in the sprawl, and we must be doing it for some reason. So it's inexpensive, at least in terms of what you get, right? Try living in downtown Chicago and having, uh, you know, uh, 4,000 square feet, three bathrooms and a three car garage, maybe five bathrooms. I don't really know. I haven't been in a McMansion in a while, but it's you, you would you would pay millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars for such a thing in the middle of Chicago. Out in East Bloomington, you could get it for a quarter of a million. So you get more bang for your buck in um, the sprawl than you do in the city. And it's convenient in terms of goods and services to consumers because everything is, is um, so um, available by automobile. You know, it can create opportunities for economic development, certainly the construction industry when, when um, developers want to build out and they hire the construction workers um, and that produces jobs and it produces income. And so there's an economic development argument to be made for it, certainly. And there's a, an argument to be made that it sort of makes, it renders rural areas less remote and less isolated and less disconnected from the rest of the society. Cheaper housing, I guess we already kind of talked about that. And potentially safer neighborhoods. And I have a question mark after this one because there's some debate in the literature about whether sprawl is actually safer. If you'll recall Jane, um, Jane, why am I blanking on her name? Jane Jacobs um, from a couple of days ago was talking about uh, how, you know, Greenwich Village, because of its diversity and its density, was actually a safer place. 
And so there's some debate about this, but many of us move to the sprawl because we are under the impression, at least, that it's safer. And of course, this has everything to do with the fact that it's also segregated. That creates the impression, not the actual reality of being safer. And arguably, there are easier commutes with, if we live in the sprawl and we work in the sprawl. All right, so these are some of the advantages and disadvantages of sprawl. But let's talk a little bit about where sprawl actually comes from. Why is sprawl, or the suburbs, the sort of dominant um, real estate development approach of the United States in the 20th and potentially in the 21st century as well. Where does it come from? Well, Euclidean zoning uh, became the norm as of 1926 and Euclidean zone and Euclidean zoning is called Euclidean zoning because um, of a Supreme Court case in, in 1926, uh, the town of Euclid, Ohio, was sued by a real estate development company called Ambler Realty, and they sued the town of Euclid, Ohio, because the town of Euclid had had um, had this sort of zoning ordinance, and it Ambler Realty wanted to build in an area that was zoned for a different kind of of land use type and so the town said no you can't do that it goes against our zoning ordinance and Ambler Realty said well I own the GD land I can do whatever I effing want with it I don't know if maybe they, they cussed a lot I'm just making that part up but um, Ambler Realty was mad because they own the land and they wanted to do what they want with it and the uh, and the town was like nope sorry so Ambler Realty took them to court. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled on behalf of the town. So Ambler Realty could not develop that land the way they wanted. The town had the right to determine uh, the kinds of land use that could take place in certain areas. And so Euclidean zoning was born in 1926. And, um, you know, it was a victory for local governments and, and local planning, but it also led to sort of all these adverse impacts as well. The Federal Housing Administration was another sort of historical force for sprawl. This happened in 1936, and it was sort of a, an effort to, um, in the, in the kind of, in the context of the economic political and sort of war turmoil of the first half of the 20th century, uh, the federal government decided they needed an effort to encourage, to subsidize and promote home ownership in the United States. Most of us probably grew up in houses that we owned or that our families owned, right? It's common in 2016, it's been common as a matter of fact for many, many decades, for most middle class families to own their homes. In fact, it's so common that it's become like a rite of passage, you know, like you're an adult when you can finally buy your house, right? I remember my parents saying to me at one point, like, dude, like you're in your 30s. That's how they, they say dude a lot. Uh, actually, they don't. But um, they were like, you're in your 30s. Why don't you own a house? Like, what's wrong with you? You don't own a house and you're in your 30s. Uh, it made me feel sad, but that's what they said. Um, so it's, you know, owning a home and being an adult, this is like a rite of passage. And it's kind of, it's just a social, social norm in our society that you get to a certain point, a certain level of professionalism, you have a family, you buy a house, you don't rent anymore, right? Well, I'll tell you, and I've said this before, <laughs> I get some, I'm really traumatized by my house. I've said this before in the lectures, but um, owning your own home is a drag. I'm here to tell you, if you can rent cheaply, I would strongly recommend you do that. By the time you pay a mortgage and property taxes and repairs on this thing and have to clean it and stuff, it's, you're, you're better off not owning a house. It's a, it's a scam. But it's a scam that we have bought hook, line, and sinker in the United States and have for many, many 
generations. And so, and the origin of this, getting back to the thing, the origin of this is the Federal Housing Administration, 1936. The goal was to subsidize and promote home ownership before 1936, right? Today, it's super common. All of our families own houses, most of them anyway. If we live in the city, maybe some of you might come from Chicago proper. You might not own a house in Chicago because it's crazy expensive. But most of us, if we come from the suburbs, we own houses. And um, before 1936, this was not the case. Before 1936, home ownership was very exclusive. Very few people owned homes. And uh, most, the vast majority of us rented. And this whole idea of home ownership as part of the American dream as when you become an adult and a professional and have a family, you buy a house. That, was, that didn't exist before 1936. This is a, a social construct of the 20th century. And so the Federal Housing Administration came along and they were like, um, what are we going to do to promote home ownership? Well, we'll subsidize um, home ownership by um, uh, tax exemptions for paying a mortgage. So you can get tax ex exemptions for paying a mortgage, and so that helps encourage people to buy houses. Another way they did it was by um, in insuring mortgages. So the, the, so the federal government insured mortgages, which made it much easier for banks to offer mortgages, which made it much easier for customers to buy mortgages. And so this whole phenomenon of like, well, you can buy, quote unquote, a house with 20% down, right? If you got 20, sometimes it's even 10%. You got, you want to buy a quarter of a million dollar house, all you need in savings is 25 grand. You put that down, you can get the rest as a loan to buy the house. Well, you own the house ostensibly, but frankly, between you and me, the bank owns your damn house. Um, and... So this whole idea of being able to, to buy a house with 10 or 20 percent down, that came from the Federal Housing Administration. And once that happened, historically, once that happened, it opened up the prospect of home ownership to a much, much greater percentage of the American population. And so once, all of a sudden, essentially overnight, so many more of us could afford to buy houses... Then there was all of a sudden a crazy demand for houses that didn't exist. And so housing prices skyrocketed. And to deal with that, to take some of the pressure off the housing market and to meet some of the demand, we started building the suburbs, right? So the Federal Housing Administration had a lot to do with the origin of the suburbs. Um, and then the Federal Highway Act, which came along in the 1950s, really kind of sealed the deal. The Federal Highway Act was uh, passed by Eisenhower. This was the act that, um, that created the interstates. Okay, So before 1956, there were no interstates. You couldn't just jump on the highway and zip from city to city. Everything was back roads, right? No such thing as like on and off ramps before 1956. Everything was back roads. And so once we had interstate highways, the Federal Highway Act, then we could connect these suburbs with the cities in such a way that it became much easier for you to actually live outside of the city and commute into the city to work. And so all of these things came together and created uh, basically the, the perfect storm of social forces to give rise to sprawl, which has become the sort of predominant real estate development model in our, in our country. And urban renewal, as we talked about last time, was part of this as well, right? The demolishing of, uh, of slums, the um, cutting up of cities, um, the large projects and so forth pushed a lot of people out of cities into inner ring suburbs. The expansion of the automobile market kind of goes without saying that this went hand in hand with the Highway Act and cheap land, right? So we were looking to buy more land. In fact, you might say, in fact, you not might say, you could say, you certainly could say, I would say, I am saying, 
that the single solitary most important force in accounting for the proliferation of urban sprawl in our country is the quest on the part of real estate developers to always be acquiring cheaper land. 